hosted by the People's CDC, uh, a watchdog, a CDC watchdog organization, uh, a organization of health justice and health advocacy. Today, we're thrilled, we're absolutely thrilled to be joined by representatives from the National Nurses United, the Long COVID Justice Network, the Patient Justice, uh, the Patient-Led Research Collaborative, and other powerful experts and advocates for the public health. My name is Rita Valenti. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm a volunteer with the People's CDC. It's timely to host this gathering today, when it was four years ago this week that the World Health Organization declared SARS-CoV-2 a pandemic, and that just 12 days ago, the leadership of the CDC evaporated the already weakened isolation guidelines critical to our safety. All this despite COVID-19 still being with us, with its peaks and valleys, surges and contagions. And today, roughly, we're still experiencing about a thousand people in the United States dying every week from COVID and roughly 17 million people suffering from the long-term effects of long COVID and post-COVID. Panelists today will discuss the continued pattern of CDC's leadership under the Biden administration uh, in issuing guidelines that are more aligned with corporate, commercial, and short-term political interests rather than the interests of the public health. We are urging the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Director, Dr. Mandy Cohen, to first revisit the abrupt elimination of the uh, of isolation guidelines. Two, open the CDC guidance to public comment to a public comment period. And three, make CDC processes transparent and accountable to the public uh, and community groups, not corporate interests, not hospital groups, private insurance industry, or big pharma and uh, other corporate interests that have compromised the CDC's uh, recommendations in spite of their often very good science. So with no further ado, uh, it's really my honor uh, to present to you first today, we have a number of panelists, uh, Dr. Kim Rhodes, uh, an epidemiologist and biostatistician at the University of California, San Francisco. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to add that part of what I do in my work at UCSF is um, a, a lead a group called Emoja Health, which uh, convenes over 100 partners across the Bay Area to keep ourselves uh, informed and abreast of what's happening with COVID from the perspective of um, how it is impacting Black and Brown communities specifically, um, and not just sort of following or toting uh, the party line. So what, um, what I have to share is just an overview of how we have been um, following the pandemic and also a bit of commentary on uh, how the new guidance is going to impact uh, our community. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so, so I think as everyone is aware um, and why you're here is because on March 1st, um, the CDC went ahead and dropped the five-day isolation guidance for COVID-19 um, and uh, with the goal of, in their opinion, bringing recommendations for COVID-19 in line with advice for other respiratory infections, including flu and respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. Um, the idea is that offering a single set of, of unified guidance would make people more likely to follow it, um, according to CDC experts. But in reality, the self does not even follow the CDC's own data. First of all, this guidance would have you believe that COVID is like the flu, when in fact, I think we know that it is not. Um, the uh, the CDC's own data comparing the the percentage of deaths in uh, Americans over 65 um, really clearly uh, demonstrates the dramatic difference 
between deaths attributed to COVID, shown here in the yellow line, yellow orangish line, versus deaths attributed to flu in the blue line. This is not a small difference. These two things are not the same. Furthermore, their own data cited in the brief that, um, that justifies this change in guidance, which you know, I, I should really emphasize that the, the, what the change in guidance says is that after 24 hours of having symptoms, if you're feeling better, you feel fine, um, you don't have a fever and you haven't taken any fever reducing medications that you can just get back out there and circulate. But some of the data that they cited in the brief itself suggests that if you look at um, cultured SARS-CoV-2, and that's in this light blue line here, and this is a trend showing over the number of days of, of um, onset of symptoms, the proportion of uh, folks who are positive, you actually see that the, the greatest risk of transmission, which is a, a, what the culture positive is a proxy for, happens right around the beginning of the onset of symptoms. So even if folks feel fine and they're out there mixing it up, this is the point at which uh, after a day of being positive, this is the point at which they're more likely to infect more people. And, I, and, and in fact, this is a little bit um, offensive to me because we know from early on in the pandemic that a huge proportion, more than 50% of transmission happens from asymptomatic people. So the idea that if you feel fine, you're probably not transmitting um, flies directly in contrast to the CDC's own data and published data that we have known really since 2020, 2021. Now, I think you know the CDC is looking at this death curve and saying, well, look, the deaths are down. COVID's not causing as many deaths. But if we really look at it in terms of numbers, we're at a point right now where we're seeing uh, more than 500 deaths per week. That's 2,000 deaths per month. And I don't know if the CDC thinks that that's acceptable, but these this guidance actually is going to make that number go up. And even if we don't think that death is the best proxy for kind of how we manage COVID, I think we need to think about the disability that comes with COVID. Long COVID right now um, is estimated by, again, by the CDC's own, um, it, the Household Pulse Survey um, is affecting 16 million Americans. And if you look by comparison, and this data actually is from June to July of 2022, um, this is actually about 5% of Americans uh, are uh, reporting suffering from long COVID. I do believe the number has gone up in the 20 uh, to 22 to 23 data. But this is significant when you compare it to the uh, prevalence of other diseases that are either infectious or highly prevalent in our, uh, in our communities. These other diseases actually have treatments. There is no treatment that is FDA approved for long COVID. And so what we're promising is more disability um, in the American population. The symptoms, of course, can range across a number of different organ systems. And I want to re-emphasize that that's another way in which long COVID is not the flu. The flu does not cause vascular inflammatory um, effects that then manifest themselves in a number of different ways that I think you'll hear a little bit more about from some of our other panelists. But what it does cause is significant disability that is not just impacting the individual. It's going to impact our society, and I think we've already seen it. In 2022, you may remember Fed Chair Jerome Powell explicitly named COVID-19 related death and disability as a significant contributor to the loss um, of the US um, uh, labor workforce. So this is not just about individuals. This is actually about the impact on our society. And as the guidelines fly in the face of the CDC's own data, it is very clear that the motivation for the change is not about public health. So clearly it is about some other factors that I think we'll hear about later. But again, why are we favoring business and business interests and economic advancement and, and um, capitalism over the health of the body politic? 
it is the body politic that makes up that strong economy. So I really urge the CDC to be more transparent and to include the public in driving the agenda for public health. Thank you so much, Dr. Rhodes, for that incredibly impressive and valuable uh, presentation. We really appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Um, next, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you um, Rosalind De Leon Minch uh, nat with the National Nurses United, an industrial hygienist with a great deal of expertise. And NNU has been one of the leading forces um, encouraging and advocating and pressuring the CDC to do the right thing. Thank you so much for being with us, Rosalind. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, so as Rita mentioned, my name is Rosalind Dela Minch and I am an industrial hygienist with National Nurses United, the largest union and professional association for registered nurses in the United States. Uh, thank you all so much for inviting me to this important conversation. So National Nurses United condemns CDC's recent decision to combine COVID guidance with other respiratory viruses and to shorten its COVID isolation guidance for public health. Um, CDC's latest decision to once again weaken protections for public health is really disheartening, but it's also not surprising. Um, the CDC has a very clear pattern of acquiescing to industry pressure, prioritizing the economy over worker and public health, especially throughout the COVID pandemic. And this move is really antithetical to public health and dangerously minimizes the ongoing and significant health threats that COVID and long COVID continues to pose, disingenuously treating COVID the same as seasonal flu or common colds. And this conflation is categorically false. The science unequivocally demonstrates that as Dr. Rhodes uh, mentioned, COVID is far more dangerous than the flu. COVID does not result in long-term immunity protection, even with the same variant. Uh, this virus continues to evolve and each successive uh, variant has become more transmissible and better at evading infection and or vaccine-induced immunity. And COVID can also damage the immune system and lead to immune dysfunction. Instead of recommending comprehensive measures to limit COVID infections and their long-term health outcomes and advocating for social supports to enable people to follow these measures, the CDC is abandoning the public by recommending guidance that will force people to work while sick, normalizing mass infections, disability, and death unmitigated transmission and the abandonment of public health measures are subjecting more and more workers to repeat COVID infections, which increases their risk of developing long COVID, rendering them vulnerable to a disabling disease, one that can impact nearly every organ system and for which there is currently no treatment or cure. And each subsequent infection increases their risk of long COVID and organ and tissue damage, as well as immune dysregulation. And nurses across the country see the devastating impacts of long COVID on both their patients, many of whom were essential workers exposed because of employer neglect and themselves as frontline healthcare workers. An untold number of healthcare workers have been occupationally exposed to and infected with COVID because of their employer's failures to provide safe workplaces combined with weak CDC COVID infection control guidance for healthcare settings. So throughout the COVID pandemic, reports from NNU nurses show a very clear pattern of employers failing to provide workers with critical protections against COVID and justifying their neglect by saying that they are following CDC guidance. And a news most recent COVID survey shows that healthcare workers still do not have the protections they need to care for patients safely. Just 72% of hospital registered nurses report having access to a sufficient supply of N95 or other kinds of respirators on their unit. That ought to be 100% every single time. And these unsafe working conditions are directly contributing to the current staffing crisis in healthcare, as many nurses are leaving the bedside or their profession entirely because they're no longer willing uh, to work uh, or able to work under these really unsafe conditions that risk their patients and their health. And on top of that, long COVID is con also contributing to the staffing crisis 
as many nurses are unable to work or have reduced their work hours because of their uh, debilitating long COVID symptoms, which could all have been avoided had the CDC provided strong infection control guidance for healthcare, um, employers would then have had to prioritize the health and safety of healthcare workers when the pandemic first began. And CDC's failure in this regard remains true even as we enter the fifth year of the pandemic. And the CDC's latest update follows other work done to relax infectious disease protections at the CDC. So late last year, the CDC's Healthcare Infection Control Practice Advisory, known as HICPAC, drafted infection control guidance updates that propose to lump COVID with seasonal respiratory viruses like influenza, essentially setting the stage to downgrade respiratory protections and other PPE for healthcare workers caring for patients infected with COVID and other uh, pathogens transmitted in the air. The CDC's recent decision to, is adopting a very similar approach, which is incredibly flawed, um, both downplay the risk of COVID and long COVID. The CDC has stated multiple times that they are following the science, but what HICPAC is proposing is anti-science. They are refusing to recognize decades of scientific evidence on aerosol transmission and respiratory protection. And this is largely because HICPAC is industry dominated. Not a, not a single frontline healthcare worker or their union is represented here. And then you have been leading the campaign to ensure protections for healthcare workers and patients and engage the input of healthcare workers um, who will be most impacted by these changes made to infection control guidance. And in response to extensive action and advocacy by NNU and other allies, the CDC did send the draft back um, to HICPAC to resolve some of our concerns. They committed to expanding the scope of expertise on the committee, um, but has not made the results of that work public. The bottom line is this prioritizing of employers by the CDC must change. Nurses and other healthcare workers are the frontline response to disease outbreak and pandemic situations and for day-to-day -day infection control. We cannot afford for the CDC to continue weakening guidance for um, in healthcare settings or in public health. And downgrading protections for healthcare workers and nurses will further exacerbate the current staffing crisis in healthcare as more nurses will leave the bedside due to these unsafe conditions and the health impacts of long COVID. And you can help us by signing our petition by going to nationalnursesunited.org slash CDC. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roslyn. Thank you so much. And we thank NNU for its vigorous work around the HICPAC guidelines. Uh, the People's CDC was very happy to partner with NNU through this process. And it's also interesting to note that this reduction in uh, isolation uh, guidelines to 24 hours uh, uh, being a febrile um, without having taken any anti-inflammatories it's important to note the kind of control that that increases of employers over the workforce overall, especially given the fact that one in five civilian workers do not have paid sick leave. And there's a number of places in Texas that have actually banned municipalities and counties from uh, offering uh, paid sick leave to their employers, employees, the workers. So uh, we're united. We are united in this struggle. Um, next, I would like to uh, thank uh, and introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Laura Germanis, um, MD and Masters of Public Health. Lara is also uh, the lead author of the People's CDC External Review, soon to be published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Germanis. Thank you so much. Um, this is really uh, exciting, an exciting moment. Um, I'm also going to share a link to our forthcoming um, paper, which is up as a pre-proof right now on the website um, of the American Journal of Preventive Medicine Focus. Um, this was uh, work that was um, ongoing for many years, and I'm sorry, for, for basically an entire year-long um, effort. And I think really an emblematic process of the way that we would have liked to have seen the CDC do its work fully engaged with the public. And so now I'm going to present to you 
um, some of our findings from our paper called Too Many Deaths, Too Many Left Behind, a People's External Review of U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's COVID-19 Pandemic Response. And so first of all, uh, you know, I'm just going to do a little bit of a retrospective to put in perspective what our initial speakers have really said very well and just demonstrate to you um, that this latest guidance is very much a pattern, part of a pattern of the way that the CDC has managed the pandemic from the very beginning and the serious consequences that occur when we don't put people and public health first. First of all, just taking a look overall at life expectancy in the United States as compared with other peer nations has consistently declined. And you can see here, you know, this was a news story um, back in November that life expectancy at birth has, you know, had declined substantially in the United States and um, is showing somewhat of a rebound, but again, still not to pre-pandemic levels. And of course, um, those those are also disproportionately impacting um, communities of color, um, indigenous people in this country. So what we did was a we used a modified Delphi approach to uh, basically engage with a set of public health experts. Um, and then through an iterative series of discussions, identified eight core pandemic domains, um, areas in which we um, thought should be key to addressing a pandemic. We then disseminated a survey among nearly 500 public health experts and people impacted by COVID in partnership with the People's CDC and Marked by COVID. We then did a, an ethnographic content review of over 200 journal articles, newspaper articles, CDC websites, and communications materials. And you can see here, the these are just the breakdown of the people who did provide demographic information who participated in the survey. A lot of folks who were healthcare workers, members of community organizations, um, and then um, a number of people who were public health educators or other kinds of educators, um, and many people who identified either as disabled or retired. So a lot of people who were disproportionately impacted um, and identified as such by, um, by the pandemic. What we found was that over 65% of respondents disagreed or strongly disagreed that the CDC met expectations in those eight areas of pandemic management that we had identified. Um, and we organized them as ethics, equity and justice, um, and you can see here sort of the dark purple um, to um, uh, and purple colors. That's the people who are strongly disagreeing or disagreeing. Um, scientific integrity, public health infrastructure, communication, inclusion, addressing root causes, and of course, disease control and prevention. Overarchingly, we found three major shortcomings of the CDC's pandemic response. First, the CDC leadership downplayed the serious impacts and aerosol transmission risks of COVID-19. Second, CDC leadership had aligned public guidance with commercial and political interests over its own scientific evidence in many cases. And lastly, CDC guidance focused on individual choice rather than emphasizing prevention and equity. I'm gonna show you some examples now in those various areas. So, uh, you know, I think that this was a feeling that we all had watching the CDC guidance, but it's really interesting when you sit down and you actually look at the CDC's Twitter communications, which allows an in-depth um, and really quantitative look at the way that the CDC is communicating this information. And, you know, I will say I have received feedback from reviewers saying, well, not everybody looks at Twitter. You know, this is probably not representative. And um, overwhelmingly, the Twitter communications very much reflect the other communications that the CDC was putting out there um, in the messaging that it was communicating to the media. Um, so during the respiratory virus season, before the end of the public health emergency, the CDC tweeted 101 times about COVID in comparison to 401 times about the flu. The CDC also has an at CDC flu account. It doesn't have any such account to talk about COVID. Um, and also overwhelmingly, the CDC has emphasized vaccines, right? 61.4% of all tweets about COVID and 46% of tweets about flu are talking about vaccines as a form of protection. Vaccines are very important. They do help to protect against long COVID. 
But masks are also really important and are much more, probably more effective actually than vaccines at preventing COVID infection. Um, and, you know, but masks uh, got only two tweets um, as compared to hand hygiene and covering your cough, which um, also got two tweets total. Um, and so again, um, we'll see just that the CDC is tending to emphasize these measures that are much less effective um, at preventing transmission of COVID-19, which is airborne, um, with CDC Director Wolensky emphasizing good hand hygiene, you know, cover your cough, um, is really not that effective at preventing COVID, which is, um, you know, suspended in the air, and it's much more effective when you're wearing masks and using ventilation and other tools in our toolkit um, to layer protections to prevent COVID transmission. Also CDC, as our um, speakers have already started to introduce, downplays the serious impacts of COVID. The CDC emphasized the serious risk of illness and death from the flu much more than COVID, regardless of COVID causing more deaths and hospitalizations. So you can see here that um, overwhelmingly, again, the CDC really focuses on this message about older adults, immunocompromised adults, people in special categories can become severely ill. When you take a look at the communications coming out of CDC about the flu, it's actually very different. They communicate to the general public and they even present these messages about how people are at serious risk anybody can become, um, you know, healthy people can become sick with the virus. Um, and then there are even individual stories of people who were harmed. Um, they also talk a lot about the deaths of the flu, but they don't talk about COVID deaths. Um, there were zero tweets in that time period talking about childhood deaths from COVID as compared to 25 tweets talking about child deaths from flu in that same time period even though actually more children died from COVID than the flu in the same time period. And again, many more people were um, died from COVID than the flu in last year's flu season. Um, similarly to the data that Dr. Rhodes presented, again, we're seeing the same this year, and more people were hospitalized um, from COVID than the flu. And just again, just some examples of these CDC communications, this communication that says the flu can be serious, talking about how this one woman lost half of her lung due to a, co a flu infection. No such tweets about COVID. Um, the CDC during flu season sends one tweet a week letting you know about how many children died from the flu. They even send tweets when only one child dies. Again, no such reminders about COVID. And then these, these flu burden estimates that are also sent out weekly. Again, no such estimates about COVID. So it's no wonder that the public wants to quote unquote move on. They also don't have all the information to make those decisions for themselves. Uh, again, we've heard this over and over, but this idea of the CDC scientific interpretations being influenced by commercial and public interests, just a reminder about when the Delta CEO asked the CDC to cut the quarantine time, and then shortly thereafter the CDC did so, it's really difficult not to think that that had some influence. And CDC guidance has also shifted following politicized representations of public opinion. Um, you know, it's really um, uh, interesting to see in mid-February 2022, um, you know, this was something that had been circulating a lot on social media, a memo had reportedly circulated in the House and Senate Democratic campaigns from Impact Research, which is a Democratic polling firm, which recommended that Democrats should declare the crisis phase of COVID over and push for feeling and acting more normal. And strikingly, a couple weeks later, when President Biden delivered his State of the Union address, uh, it contained a lot of similar language. But most interestingly, poll data from the same period showed that most Americans believed the pandemic was not under control and still supported pandemic mitigation measures. Rec remember that in 2022, it was right after the Omicron surge um, when the hospitals had been overwhelmed and ambulances were circulating for hours, being unable to place patients in ICU. So people were reasonably still concerned. I just wanna show you a graph of that poll data, which I think is just really interesting. You see here, you know, and people's concern about masks, people's concern about COVID, um, you know, really ebbs and flows where 
um, especially it, it has a lot to do with how many cases there are out there, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, a lot of people were still concerned um, that COVID was uh, of great risk. 40% of people here in, you know, in, in, um, dis, in not, I'm sorry, fam, January, February of 2022, believing that COVID actually was high risk, right? And then, or so, so like very few people believe in COVID was of little or no risk. And then, you know, as the numbers started to decrease, sure, that number, you know, fewer people are thinking, uh, are more and more people are starting to be less concerned. But then once the CDC ended, made this declaration, oh, you know what, no need to wear masks, and then all of the employers took away the mask mandates, that resulted in a sudden shift. It, it preceded a sudden shift in public opinion. And this is just to say that the CDC keeps saying, we're just meeting people where they're at. But the point is that the CDC is shaping public opinion by making these public declarations. And when they say, you know, when they make a big change, they're really communicating, it is safe to do this. And that's not really the full message. The full message is a little bit more complicated than that. And people need the full information in order to make their own decisions. Again, also the CDC is favoring individual choice over prevention and equity. Um, so if this expectation that people are going to make their own decisions, that they have power over you know, their circumstances in order to protect themselves. Um, when Evusheld ceased to be authorized, the CDC recommended that people make their own individual protection plans. CDC has um, repeatedly communicated things like your health is in your hands, get vaccinated. And of course, with an airborne virus, nobody can protect themselves alone. And this was a theme in the comments that we heard um, from the people who gave us, um, you know, uh, quotes in, uh, in response to our survey, with many disabled people communicating that they have been homebound and that as the CDC has removed layers of protection, um, they're not only finding it difficult to protect themselves because they're, you know, rationing N95s because they're expensive, um, also postponing medical appointments um, because it's really difficult to protect oneself and becoming even more and more isolated from friends and family. And so in conclusion, we have some overarching recommendations for the CDC um, from that report. And of course, from this group today, I think we're offering the same recommendations, just saying that the CDC has a duty to provide policymakers and the public with high quality evidence to promote public health. And that means communicating the science to the public is really what the CDC needs to be doing partnering with institutions and communities to create conditions that allow people to protect each other and make public spaces safer for all. And lastly, a plan to protect everybody, especially the most vulnerable, will be better in the long term for people, the economy, and future generations. And so in sum, we are really here today uh, urging the CDC to create a public accountability process to ensure that you're really engaging with the public as you make these policies, which really do shape people's ability to protect themselves from disability, um, serious illness, and death. And uh, thank you to all of the wonderful people and um, organizations that helped support this effort. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much. Um, what a powerful report. And I just encourage everybody uh, to please check out the external, the People CDC external review uh, to be published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. Uh, I believe that Lara already put the link in the chat. It is a thoroughly, very comprehensive report. And I also want to make note that the way that the CDC is approaching uh, the, the pandemic makes an assumption that the public can't understand uh, the science and what's going on. And we actually believe that the public is perfectly capable of understanding the science if it's broken down clearly, if people understand this is a novel virus and uh, recommendations may change based on uh, our increased understanding about how this virus actually operates, but we know uh, the, the, the death, morbidity, mortality that COVID-19 continues uh, to, to wreak 
uh, havoc on our populations, and particularly as it relates to long COVID. We're not going to reach the level of trust that's necessary without an uh, honest uh, accounting of uh, recommendations that correspond to the science that's actually being produced. So with no further ado, I have the honor of, uh, and thank you again, Lara, thank you so much. Uh, of introducing Lisa McCorkle, uh, Masters of Public Policy and co-founder of the Patient-Led Research Collaborative. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, as Rita said, my name is Lisa McCorkle and I am a co-founder of the Patient-Led Research Collaborative, which is a group of people with long COVID and other infection associated chronic conditions who conduct research on long COVID and advocate for better policies. Tomorrow marks my four year anniversary of having long COVID. And on Friday, as an international community, we mark International Long COVID Awareness Day. At least 17 million American adults and millions more children have long COVID with people of color, transgender people and disabled people at higher risk. As COVID continues to spread with reinfections increasing your risk for developing long COVID, vaccines having minimal protection and most long COVID cases onset from an initially mild case of COVID. The number of people with long COVID will continue to grow now faster with the CDC guidance lowering and in asymptomatic cases, removing isolation protocols. And with shortened isolation periods, people will not get the rest that they need to adequately recover, which also increases your risk for long COVID. We are very much still in a pandemic. There are still hundreds of deaths per day from COVID, and we are not at a place in our long COVID response to roll back COVID protections. Recovery rates for long COVID are low. One study found that after two years, less than 8% of people with long COVID were fully recovered, and there are no FDA approved curative treatments. Millions are unable to work and attend school. Our social safety net, including disability benefits are often failing people with long COVID. Lowering the isolation period for symptomatic COVID and removing it for asymptomatic COVID is not based in science. We know that peak COVID infectiousness can vary from two to five days after an infection begins, and yet this policy does not account for this. While I appreciate the aspects of the guidance for what to do if you have the flu, RSV, and other non-COVID respiratory viruses like masking and improving ventilation, Without isolating during peak infectiousness to, for COVID, this guideline will cause preventable deaths, disability, and reduced quality of life. As we recognize Long COVID Awareness Day on Friday, I urge the CDC to be aware of the reality of long COVID and to reevaluate and enact equity and science-based policies. In addition to putting in place guidance that reflects the science, the CDC must have public communication on the risks of long COVID in adults and children, as one third of the public still has not even heard of long COVID. We need public communication on encouraging masking while sick and on the risks of COVID reinfection, including the risk of uh, developing long COVID after reinfection. The CDC must continue and expand the tracking of the incidence of long COVID. The CDC must ensure that there is mandatory masking in healthcare settings so that people have a better chance at accessing needed healthcare without risking their health. The CDC must facilitate improvements in indoor air quality in public spaces, especially in schools and healthcare settings. And the CDC should ensure that COVID rapid tests are widely available to enable detection of infections with negative rapid tests two days in a row being the sign that one's COVID isolation can end. As I mark my four year anniversary of having long COVID tomorrow, I am disheartened. My community has not just been left behind, but neglected. We are not safe in this world. And as a result, unfortunately more will join us and we will get worse. After four years of a pandemic that devastated communities, I wish that as a society, we would have finally learned to live the values that we claim. That we would have implemented policies that value the lives of the immunocompromised, of disabled people, of poor people, of people of color. For those who have lost their lives to COVID and long COVID, it is too late for CDC to change its course. But I desperately urge the CDC to hear our call and to do what is very much in their power to do, to increase the isolation period and adequately respond to this crisis. There's really too much at stake. Thank you. 
Lisa, I want to um, thank you so much uh, for your your moving presentation, and we share uh, we share with you the the pain, the grief, and the trauma that long COVID is causing for millions uh, millions of us in this country and indeed worldwide. Um, it's part of, I think, an ongoing narrative that is wrapped around dehumanization, a normalization of death, dying, and sickness that must be combated so that we as human beings can enjoy, uh, enjoy life, enjoy world, heal the earth, and actually develop relationships with each other as opposed, uh, as opposed to uh, corporate uh, interests dominating our lives. Thank you, thank you so much, Lisa, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. And now uh, I have the the honor and pleasure of introducing Raj Chekslashaya. Um, Raj, if I pronounced your name wrong, please say it again. I'm so sorry. Raj is a PhD candidate. He's the U unit chair of the United Auto Workers Local 2865 at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I'm assuming uh, very active uh, in the uh, UCLA strikes um, uh, last year. Thank you so much for joining us today. Raj, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Rita. And uh, it's Raj Kaglashia, but it's okay. Uh, everyone, but it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about how uh, uh, how COVID affects our freedom to live our lives and how that interacts with uh, our ability to even work. So public health gives us the freedom to pursue our dreams and to care for our families, our friends, and our communities. Without it, that freedom is threatened as we are constantly in an environment where long-term illness is the only one wrong breath away from taking away that freedom, rendering us incapable of helping those we care about and pursuing our dreams in life. Let's take labor, for example. We work in order to sustain our families so that our children can have a future and to save up enough money to pursue our higher goals. Thus, our ideal working environment needs to be one that enables that freedom rather than takes it away. Threats to that ideal working environment are labor issues, and had these units sure I've seen many, many workers screwed over by our university uh, uh, and many issues from wages to uh, uh, disability issues to uh, international student issues. There's a wide variety of issues, and uh, public health is one of those issues. And a major ongoing threat to this working environment is our ongoing pandemic in the face of the destruction of public health. COVID is a labor issue. One in 10 COVID infections result in long COVID, a multi-organ disease with no known cure, and 61.8% of California farm workers now have long COVID as a result. Our most vulnerable coworkers, those with disabilities, those who are older and younger, and those who are at high risk, are constantly put in life or death situations whenever they have to go in person to a workplace with no mask. And repeat infections weaken the immune system causing all of us to become high risk and become more susceptible to other viruses, as the recent RSV outbreaks in children have shown us. And make no mistake, every single one of us falls under the high risk category right now, as that category is very broad. People who are overweight or obese, people who are pregnant, people who are physically inactive, and even people who have gotten infected by COVID at least once. If the CDC follows through with their continued destruction of public health by taking away the five-day isolation period that stands in between life and death for so many of us, then our freedom to pursue our dreams and care for one another will be further taken away from us as the air we breathe becomes more stuffed with this dangerous virus. And it is a double whammy in that it makes our own workplace even more dangerous to our health than it already is, making the place where we're supposed to earn the income necessary to sustain our families even more of a place where we instead get long-term illness that takes away our ability to get that income in the first place. And what is the reason that the CDC is giving for taking away our freedom? And it's justifying it by saying that we do not have enough sick leave to isolate. But that too is a labor issue. Paid sick leave enables our freedom to live the healthy lives necessary to pursue our goals and help our communities by making sure that infectious people can stay at home without worrying about their pay getting cut so that we can work without getting sick with a disabling virus. If the CDC actually cared about public health, then they would champion paid sick leave as something that should be mandatory to protect these freedoms. No, the real reason why they are taking away our freedom is to protect our boss's freedom 
to make us go to work sick so they can squeeze every last dollar from us. And in the case of those of us workers who are at most risk, they want our debts for their dollars. It is unsurprising but disappointing that the CDC cares more for our employers' freedom and lives than the freedom and lives of the common people. This is why we organize together as workers to form labor unions. Our bosses and elites may be powerful, but we outnumber them and they are scared of our numbers. We can and must pass resolutions for guaranteed sick leaves in our union contracts. We can and must fight for provisions for clean air, masked workplaces, and free and fast PCR and rapid tests. We also need employers to meet workers' accommodations requests without having to jump through the burdensome hurdles, provide medical documentation in a world where many long COVID patients are gaslit by misinformed providers about their sickness. These are all things that are not only possible, but are already underway in our struggle. University of Michigan graduate student workers, for example, won the right to request students to wear masks and to request remote teaching in their contract last year. Over 500 workers in the UC system signed a petition calling on our bargaining team to add a public health article to our union contract during the 2022 academic worker strike. And even though they did not ultimately end up doing it, our union was eventually pushed by us to create a UC-wide public health working subgroup to address COVID issues. And in Arizona, workers have recently won the right to workers' compensation for getting COVID in the workplace. We can draw from the lessons of the 20th century worker struggles to make workplaces no smoking zones. For example, flight attendants organized in one that this right protect their health freedom through their union organizing in the 1980s. And of course, I encourage the CDC scientists who have been releasing critical MMWRs or monthly and mortality weekly reports on the science of COVID to themselves organize as workers internally to do their duty of protecting our public health freedoms against the unscientific and freedom robbing policies like the elimination of the five day isolation period and the stance that paid sick leave that uh, is uh, not uh, necessary. This could, for example, be done through the Federal Workers Union, the AFGE. Always remember, our employers are afraid of our power in numbers. If we organize, then we will win. And we'll get back our public health that gives us the freedom to pursue our dreams and care for our families, friends, and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. Um, you remind me and and you make us realize that we are a part of a very large working class, whether it's doctors working in academic institutions, auto workers in, uh, in, in unions, in factories and in uh, universities, whether it's nurses unionizing like gangbusters, even in the South, which is where I'm from in Georgia, uh, gig workers, graduate students organizing, all of us together, whether you're in the meatpacking industry or a poultry worker, a farm worker, a physician, a PhD, a scientist, we are all part of a big working class. And this is whom the CDC should be, the leadership of the CDC should be responsible to. And it should also be responsible to its own workers who are producing excellent science, but then are gathering gaslit by, uh, uh, by horrific uh, recommendations. Um, Starbucks workers, Amazon workers, workers throughout the country are unionizing to gain strength that we know is so important to launch a political motion in this country that changes uh, from a death narrative to a narrative of love of life, love of humanity. Thank you so much, Raj. Um, and now it is my pleasure, my distinct pleasure, to introduce Gabriel Sand Emeterio, um, Masters of Social Work, and one of the leaders of the long COVID justice. Um, Gabriel, take it away. Thank you, Gabriel. And thank you again, Raj. Gabriel, you're on mute, my dear. <laughs> can you hear me now? I guess you can, can you hear me now? Yes. I'm yes. unmuted. Okay, great. Hi, thank you for organizing and holding this forum and thank you for including me. I'm Gabriel Sanemeterio, the co-founder of Sloan COVID Justice. And I am here as one of the millions of chronically ill and disabled Americans suffering from long COVID. And, as, as, and I am also a member of the communities most disproportionately affected by long COVID, which are Hispanic adults and LGBTQ people. 
Additionally, I'd be remiss if I didn't name that Black Americans, women, and low-income people are also disproportionately affected by long COVID. The current change to the CDC's shortened COVID isolation guideline is factually wrong, morally wrong, and practically wrong. It is factually wrong because according to the latest data in the Household Pulse Survey, long COVID rates have actually gone up from 5.3% to 6.8%. And let us not forget that it takes time to develop long COVID symptoms for the people affected to identify their symptoms and likely even longer for such individuals to get a diagnosis and be counted as having long COVID. Moreover, we just experienced a winter surge uh, of COVID and we don't know yet the number of people who will go on to develop long COVID from this most recent peak of infections. Long COVID can occur as a continuation of illness from the acute phase, or it could take months to reveal itself and look very, very different from acute COVID symptoms. People who just had COVID in the January surge may just be starting to recognize symptoms or that something is wrong, and it may take months for them to realize that they have long COVID. Long COVID symptoms can also fluctuate, adding to the complexity. Thus, a period of remission may not mean full recovery. A new guidance is morally wrong. This new guidance is morally wrong because it leaves behind and threatens the well-being and the lives of the most vulnerable people, including those who don't know themselves to be vulnerable. According to the CDC, 60% of American adults have at least one chronic condition. This is a sick nation and rolling back protections will only make us sicker. Yet the CDC, the CDC says long COVID rates are going down and their justification for the change in the guidance. But CDC's own data from the Household Pulse study shows that long COVID rates actually went up. Um, adults currently experiencing long COVID, a full quarter of them who are experiencing significant disability and limitations. Why is the CDC justifying this harmful change on the backs of people with long COVID, which is contradicted by their own data? Lastly, the guidance is practically wrong because many people who are already sick and continue to be sick have less of a chance to get better if they get reinfected multiple times. The CDC, on behalf of the Biden administration, is not doing what they should do to care for the general population. If they cared for us or about us, they would be providing education on long COVID and, many poten and the many potential risks posed by even a mild or asymptomatic COVID infection. They would conduct case finding, the public health practice of helping to identify who has long COVID and connecting them to health. If they cared about the people, the CDC would be providing support, particularly for those communities disproportionately affected by long COVID. They would be providing widespread provider education so that we would not be shamed, gaslit, or even given bad advice when we seek help. The CDC should not be taking protections away. Instead, they should provide guidelines that allow people to rest when sick with COVID or any other illness for that matter. However, the CDC is creating the con conditions that are dread detrimental to public health. Even if not a single new person got long COVID today, we have millions of people, children, adults, and seniors already sick, and it is doubtful that they will fully recover. How could we? We don't have significant resources in comparison to the level of need, and we don't have even, uh, treatments available. It is still unclear how effective vaccines are in preventing long COVID. And helpful as they may be, vaccines have become harder to access and vaccine uptake has been reduced. Only a minor percentage, roughly one in five Americans have gotten the current vaccine that offers the best, the best protection for strains circulating today. What we need from the CDC is much more public education on long COVID effective case finding and tracing for long COVID, training for medical providers to end the gaslighting of patients and to identify and diagnose long COVID effectively to provide patients with managing techniques which often require rest. We also need better data and clear information on the dangers of COVID reinfection. 
We need funding to engage with community groups and support education efforts on long COVID. We need the CDC to encourage cities and states to uphold masking in healthcare settings to protect providers and patients alike so that medical appointments are safer. We need to greatly expand legal and social support, a robust safety net not limited to disability benefits to keep people from sinking into abject poverty. The CDC and the government as a whole could do all of this, but instead they're choosing to put us in harm's way by equating COVID to the flu or RSV. Let us be reminded that COVID does not follow seasonal patterns like the flu, and that new data shows that how COVID affects the immune system, making people more likely or more susceptible to getting sick. COVID also increases the chances of experiencing adverse cardiovascular outcomes, and by now, it's been proven that COVID can damage the brain and the nervous system. What else will we find out while COVID infections are allowed to run rampant? Yet we are told that it is okay to get sick and get others sick. We have a name for what the CDC is spreading, misinformation and disinformation. Thank you. Gabriel, that was um, absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I just want to thank you so, so very much for sharing your story and pointing out something that I think we we often forget or we're often told, well, we just don't have the resources. No, 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 no. The, the resources are available. We have an abundance of resources. What we don't have is equitable distribution of resources. And, you know, it's also interesting to note that just a few years ago, the former director, uh, Walensky of the CDC, indicated, well, basically declared racism, white supremacy, a public health emergency, right? And so how can we now double down on the inequity that's being recommended uh, in terms of cutting isolation period, making it difficult to get tests, expensive tests, very difficult to get Paxlovid, um, a number of obstacles are placed in the way, not to mention that after the uh, one year ago this May, the public health emergency was ended, which has resulted in over 17 million people losing their health insurance, 70 percent of those for logistical and paper paperwork reasons. So, yeah, we have a crisis. Um, and as Gabriel said, health care, not warfare. Absolutely. The resources are there. Let's make sure that they do the job. Um, I want to now uh, uh, open uh, our conversation, and perhaps we can have a full screen, Kentra. Uh, and also, I do want to take this opportunity to thank Kentra uh, Tillman, who works with the People's CDC for her logistical work, for making the slides come up so effortlessly and beautifully, and for moving us uh, along this very important uh, conversation effortlessly. Um, and once again, thanking all of the presenters, uh, Dr. Kim Rhodes, uh, Rosalind DeLeon Minch, Dr. Lara Jimenez, Lisa McCorkle, uh, Raj Chalashki, I'm butchering that again, I'm sorry, Raj, um, and, and Gabriel San Emeterio for the brilliant uh, uh, presentations and the common threads that we're saying again, um, calling for us to, calling for the leadership of the CDC to revisit the abrupt elimination of isolation guidelines, to open CDC guidance to public, uh, to a public comment period, and above all, to make the CDC, to reorganize, indeed, the CDC, uh, to make it uh, transparent and accountable to the public and community groups, not corporate interests, not hospital groups, not insurance companies, and not big pharma, uh, who've been uh, uh, dictating uh, the responses to this. Uh, I'd like to ask, I don't know if we have press uh, on online here. I'd like to ask if there are any uh, questions to the panelists, if you'd like to put them in the chat. And if there's a particular panelist you would like uh, to respond to your question, please feel free. And we'll take just a few minutes more for q and I believe we had, uh, let me go back a little bit here. 
Uh, we had a question from uh, Kaya. Uh, is it, uh, if I may, Kaya, is it legal for the CDC to make changes that aren't supported by scientific evidence and goes against established evidence-based standards, especially without public, and when it puts everyone in active risk of death? Um, would anybody, I don't think we have any lawyers uh, involved here, but uh, would anybody like to respond to that question? Um, Rosalind, I'm going to ask, is, is it legal <laughs> for the CDC to make uh, recommendations that contradict the science? That's a great question. I'm not sure that I, I can answer that uh, fully, but I can tell you that um, the uh, CDC's advisory committee known as HICPAC, um, it is supposed to be um, you know, made public in terms of um, you know, uh, their you know what they're doing and uh they're still not providing input which is um you know one of the you know concerns that we have been pushing is for them to make uh things uh, much more transparent and to in uh in really engage the active um involvement um input of frontline healthcare workers um especially nurses who will be most impacted by um by these uh, guidelines, these updates that they are proposing in healthcare settings. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, I see Lara has her hand up for a brief answer to the question too. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to also, you know, echo what we've been told um, over and over as we've thought about ways to challenge some of these protocols, in particular, um, the way that they uh, violate the ADA protections, the Americans with Disabilities Act protections um, that prevent public health, uh, public spaces from being accessible. Um, what we're told is that the CDC as an institution, um, you know, in some ways uh, its declarations are taken as science at face value. Um, and so um, that's specifically why in spite of what, what scientific evidence may demonstrate, um, it would be very difficult or, you know, that would be one of the challenges of proving in a court of law uh, that a particular guideline um, created conditions that violated somebody's um, uh, somebody's rights. So it it is actually um, it, it's complicated, but there you know our understanding is that it, there's not um, it's not totally clear, and I think part of it is um, the way that also. Um, scientists, sorry, like academic organizations have also come out behind some of these guidelines um, that makes um, it more challenging for us to challenge them legally. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to recognize Lisa briefly, and then I want to get to another question. Lisa, please share with us. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that, you know, I think with, with this guidance, um, one of the unique aspects of it is that they paired it with background. Um, so they have this background document that they released when they released the guidance um, that I think in, in their view is saying, look, we're following the science. And it's like, this is how we came to this decision. Um, but they're very selective with what science they're following and leaving out a lot of basically all the science that we've talked about today on this call. Um, and so I think you know their argument would be, we are following the science, look at our background document. Um, but they're really just being very selective on on what um, makes their argument for them. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for that. Um, I see an earlier question uh, from Ann Hunter that I'm going to ask Dr. Rhodes uh, to reply to. Ann asks, since COVID, since COVID is less seasonal than the flu, the comparison would be even more dramatic if you gave the numbers of the hospitalizations and deaths for a full year. Yes, um, Dr. Rhodes? Sure. So I did uh, respond to that a little bit in the chat. I don't think it was exposed to everyone, but um, from my perspective, I think the the answer to that would be, you know, maybe, um, because what that misses, if we just look at deaths over the course of one year, is the clinical impacts that are not seen in hospitalization, for example. And quite frankly, death is too far downstream. The, the, the um, goal of the CDC is not just to prevent deaths, it's to prevent all morbidity um, on the pathway to, you know, the place that we ultimately all 
um, and up. So what I think that misses, if we just count the deaths, I mean, we get into the, we're basically getting in the bus with the CDC, right? The CDC is saying um, uh, that we need to use hospitalization and death as our endpoints. And that completely overlooks everything that happens in between and how the clinical manifestations um, of long COVID, for example, reduce workforce, um, our labor workforce, reduce um, people's capacity to actually do their jobs. So there are folks who maybe, you know, um, have serious cognitive disability, but cannot afford to be off work and may not, you know, have um, the label of having a disability. And I think that's another piece that I don't know that we've talked about. Like, do you get a label of, of being disabled and, and protections under ADA for having long COVID? And if you don't, then you're going to work. And if your your capacity to actually do your job is impaired, there are some other impacts that are going to happen um, that we're going to see as a, as a country, as a sort of a global community in terms of impacts that we saw, I think, in 2020 on supply chain, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're starting to see a little bit of it now. The part that concerns me is um, in air traffic control. Like those are folks we need to be working at the tippity top of their capacity. So we're going to see these impacts in different ways. It's not just about death from COVID. It is actually about the impairment and the maiming um, of the global community and how that's going to then play out in how we receive and experience, um, uh, you know, and interact with the systems that are not just about healthcare but are economic um, in our in our world. And and I just also want to put a pin in the impact on the healthcare workforce because that's also a place where you don't want people working not at their capacity. Those mistakes are going to lead to other kinds of negative outcomes. So I'm not sure that just counting deaths is the right way to go. And I hope that we're trying to prevent something more than death um, as a public health institution. Thank you so much, Dr. Rhodes. Thank you. And I see that um, we're going to try to end in just a couple of minutes. Uh, I see that Rosalind, uh, Rosalind has a uh, comment that she'd like to add to this as well. And perhaps too, Rosalind, you might uh, speak a little bit to what Dr. Rhodes was talking about in terms of the supply chain and how uh, how necessary PPE was withheld um, from healthcare workers and, uh, you know, our, our hospital corporations essentially made it very difficult um, to, to have the kind of supplies that were necessary uh, yeah. during the heights of the pandemic and still to this day. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's frightening to me to go into a hospital uh, where by definition, uh, people are uh, potentially ill, sick, immunocompromised, older, elderly, uh, uh, you know, and and face a maskless uh, healthcare provider. Very dangerous. And I know that here in Atlanta, we have some campaigns going to put masks back on hospitals, even as governors in the South threaten to withhold funds from institutions that that uh, uh, implement mask mandates. So we have a we've got a, a heck of a struggle uh, going forward. But with panelists like this and people that are listening on this call, uh, I have nothing but uh, uh, optimism uh, and joy about our ability to win the kind of public health infrastructure that we actually deserve. Um, yeah. Rosalind, can you yeah. wanna comment? Thank, Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so two points I wanna make uh, very quickly here that um, you know studies are finding that um, for many folks who have long COVID, uh, they had a, a mild in, infection. And so I think that while we are seeing the household pulse survey, uh, you know, an increase in long COVID prevalence, um, I think that's uh, incredibly, uh, you know, an undercount. It's an underestimate because there are many people out there who had either an asymptomatic infection or a mild COVID infection that they may not tie 
their symptoms, uh, you know, with long COVID. And uh, to your point, um, you know, we're, we are seeing, uh, you know, there's a healthcare uh, staffing crisis in healthcare right now because of these unsafe conditions that nurses and other healthcare workers have had to endure since the very beginning of the pandemic um, because of these weak CDC guidelines, right? And and so uh, you know in the very in the very beginning of the pandemic, nurses were told that uh, you know uh, you know wearing a bandana is is okay for you to take care of uh, someone with COVID, and you know a lot of um, which resulted in a lot of um, you know an untold number of healthcare workers and nurses dying from you know from this disease. And and you know five years in the in, into the pandemic, we have ample scientific evidence that COVID is absolutely an airborne disease, that COVID is far more dangerous than the flu. And still to this day, uh, we have surveyed nurses uh, since the very beginning of the pandemic before it was even declared a pandemic. And survey after survey shows um, repeated failures of healthcare employers across the country not providing uh, you know, protections that nurses need, nurses who are the frontline response to everyday infection control to pandemic situations and five years into the pandemic, they are still not getting the respiratory protection and other critical measures that they need. And because of that, healthcare workers, nurses are leaving the bedside. Um, and, and on top of that, uh, many of them are experiencing uh, long COVID symptoms. And yeah, you're absolutely right, Dr. Rhodes. Uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, another healthcare workforce that we need to protect because uh, uh, the most vulnerable people go to the hospital to get care. And and these uh, hospitals, they need to be uh, centers of healing and not uh, centers uh, for people to get infected even more. Thank you so much for that, Rosalind, and the passion with which you're talking. This is not an academic exercise. This is people's lives uh, and their livelihoods. So thank you for that. And I'm going to recognize Gabriel. Um, at Gabriel, uh, I was going to have you close this out, but I see Lisa's got her hand up too. So Lisa, you'll be tasked with closing us out. But uh, Gabriel, uh, you beautiful human being, please. Oh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to say that we really need legal protections in schools and in the workplace because long COVID is much more than just cognitive impairment. It's a lot broader than that, but cognitive impairment, the brain fog has gotten a lot of attention and there's a lot of stigma around it. So folks are afraid of disclosing that they have long COVID to their employers for fear that it may impact their um, careers. Um, additionally, you know, the, having the ability to rest or to take intermittent leave or to have various accommodations, whether it's an educational setting or work setting, can help people uh, minimize the impact on their cognitive impairment. So um, yes, it is, it is very important that we eliminate the stigma and protect workers and students from uh, potential retaliation from disclosing that they have long COVID and requesting accommodations. Thank you very much. Uh, I certainly remember uh, the days uh, that I was working in the uh, HIV clinic at Grady and uh, the way that uh, uh, patients were uh, discriminated against uh, uh, th that uh, had uh, HIV. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, again, my good friend, Dr. Lara Germanis, uh, to close this out. Uh, and before I do that, I wanna take a moment just to thank uh, Kentra Tillman, for uh, making this go so smoothly today. Uh, Mary Germanis for also uh, helping with all the uh, technical expertise uh, of which I completely lack. <laughs> and above all, thanking uh, all of the panelists uh, for joining us and all of the participants. And please, please uh, stay in touch with us, stay in touch with the organizations that are uh, listed in the press release. Stay in touch with the People's CDC. That's info at peoplecdc.org. And we will be getting back with you all too. Um, just, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful series of, of very informative and passionate and necessary presentations. Because, um, you know, uh, uh, we not only uh, need another world is possible, it's absolutely necessary. Um, and with that, Lara, please close us out. 
Thank you so much. And of course, um, kudos also to Rita Valenti, who's done such a phenomenal job, um, you know, uh, facilitating us and, and bringing us through and emceeing this press conference. And thanks so much to all who joined us. I just wanted to make a note that um, it was really interesting. I've learned lately that the um, federal government and, um, you know, I believe it's something that may be either coming from at least the state government in Massachusetts with public payers. Um, I'm not sure if this is something which is happening at the federal level yet, but the at the federal level, um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid have a lot of um, health equity programming now and are requiring hospital systems to demonstrate that they are asking uh, patients and documenting and offering things like language access, um, you know, asking about um, sexual orientation and gender, um, asking um, and documenting different kinds of questions and demonstrating that they are serving patients. And so so um, it's been it, it's a really a, a process that seems to be at the beginning, um, and I uh, I is something that I'm looking into more. But I think we should all be trying to figure out whether it is happening in our states or if it's at the federal level, um, because at least in Massachusetts, there are going to be these requirements to ask people about disability, then also to demonstrate that we're meeting access needs at hospitals. So um, this could be a really um, key opportunity for people to advocate for um, masks or, you know, masking accommodations as a disability right, at least in healthcare facilities. Um, so just want to flag this, encourage people to join their patient family advisory councils at hospitals, um, all hospitals and community health centers are required to have them. And just want to reflect specifically on the experience at the health system where I work, um, which is, um, you know, the, the only public hospital system in Massachusetts and where um, they, the leadership had a different approach to masking after the pan, um, after the, the public health emergency was ended, which was to say, you know, that we are going to offer to patients the ability to request masks and we don't expect any um, paperwork or, you know, all you have to do is say it. And so there are signs at the front desk that say, you know, ask me to wear a mask if you'd like one and to try and, you know, say, well, there's this thing also in healthcare. I just, you know, the more that we can be using the language of the hospitals um, to, to be, you know, <laughs> to be advocating for these, these very basic protections, I think the more effective we'll be. You know, we have the quadruple aim, this expectation that we're supposed to be improving population health, reducing costs, enhancing patient experience, right? So, so enhancing patient experience is one of the four um, pillars of the quadruple aim. And the fourth one is, you know, improving um, the healthcare worker um, experience and reducing burnout. So just, you know, being asking them to sort of meet their own objectives. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that at least uh, my health system will be able to um, have something written to present and share as an innovation in the way um, to make it possible to allow and enable patients so that people don't get this ridiculous jumping through hoops to ask for something really basic, which is that you shouldn't have to catch COVID when you're getting healthcare. Um, and, you know, just once again, thank you all so much um, for for joining us today and um, to our excellent speakers and our excellent MC and onward. Thank you again. Goodbye. All take care. Uh, much love. And we'll see you all soon again. Take care. Bye bye.